I think we're all pretty comfortable with the fact that when we take our voltmeter and we place the negative lead at the negative post of the battery and the positive lead to the positive side of the battery, that we're going to measure some kind of voltage. But the confusion starts when we move our positive lead to a ground. We don't expect to see voltage there, do we? How can you be measuring voltage when both of your meter leads are attached to a ground point? I'll explain that in today's edition of The Trainer. It's all about voltage drop. That's why it's possible for you to read voltage when both of your meter leads are connected to a ground point. Now we're going to explain that in a little more detail in just a minute. But before we can do that, it's important that we understand some foundational points first. So let's take a quick look at a basic electrical circuit and the basic functioning of that circuit as it relates to voltage drop and voltage drop testing. Here on the board, I've got just a very simple circuit. Uh, let's we'll start off looking at the components of the circuit first. First and foremost, I have a load. In this case, we're going to use a brake light bulb as our load. But a load is any device in the circuit that does the work. You know, we don't have any work to do. There's really no sense for us to have an electrical circuit in the first place. So a load can be a bulb, a horn, an ECM, a coil. Any device that does the work is the load. Now in order to get the load to work, I have to get current flowing. And before I can do that, I have to have a source of electromotive potential that we measure in terms of voltage. Well, that's what our battery represents. That's our source for this circuit. And let's just say it's a nice, healthy battery. It has 12.6 volts in it. Now, here's a key point for you. Today especially, if the battery is not able to do its job, even by a little bit, it can cause issues with the electrical systems on the vehicle. So make sure before you proceed with any form of electrical testing that you test and verify the battery condition before you go any further. Now the next element that every circuit has to have are the control devices. Maybe only one, maybe more than one, but the control device is the device used to open and close the circuit path, allowing us control over the load rather than letting the load have control over us. In this case, there's two. We have the ignition switch, then that's going to feed key voltage to the fuse, and then the second control device, the brake light switch, that actually finishes the path and allows the brake light bulb to turn on. And last but not least, there has to be some form of circuit protection. A fuse, a fusible link, or a circuit breaker. Something that will allow uh, the, the circuit to be protected should the power side or positive side of the circuit inadvertently get to ground before the load has a chance to regulate the current flowing through the circuit. And this from, you know, from Ohm's law, if that happens and we have zero or next to zero resistance, well, the current flow is just going to be off the charts. It's going to very quickly burn or damage that harness. Now, as I just said, the load is the regulator for current flow in the circuit. That's best scenario. This would be the only real source of resistance in the circuit. But is it the only source of resistance? No, everything here has some measure of resistance. The connecting points have resistance. The control devices, whether it's the contacts inside the switch or whatever the case might be, they have resistance. Even the fuse has some resistance. And of course, the wiring that connects everything has measurable resistance. But it's very, very, very small, almost insignificant when it comes to the operation of the circuit as a whole. The load represents that, that oh, what should I say? That's the standard. That's the standard barrier. He's the one that's going to determine what the current flow or normal current flow in that circuit is going to be. Now there are some things that can happen to the circuit, and you've probably seen them, that's going to cause what used to be a minor resistance to become a major one. Let's just think of connectors, for example. Burnt connectors, corroded connections, uh, connections that have been damaged by improper probing techniques. These are just a few of examples that can cause the resistance of these little small nothings in the circuit to become major thieves stealing potential from the load. Now, what do you mean by that, Pete? Again, this is a basic electrical principle. All of the available voltage will be used to overcome the resistances in the circuit 
And that means that if there's a one over here, that's, once it's a big sh uh, share, then it's gonna steal what should normally be available to the load. Let me try to explain that again. All the available voltage is used to overcome the resistance in the circuit in order to get the current to flow. So when we get to the end, there's no voltage potential left remaining. If the load is the only source of resistance in the circuit, or should be the main source of resistance in the circuit, then when we take our measurements, and let's just see if we can put a meter up here, and we place our negative meter lead to ground, and our positive meter lead up here to just before the load, then I should me measure very close to what I measured, eh, a little more like that, of what I measured at the battery. Now you're going to be within a few tenths. It's never going to be exactly the same, but it should be within a few tenths, okay? Now, if I have a problem with, oh, say a connection that's badly corroded. In other words, now this connection is a lot higher in resistance. Here's what that measurement's going to look like from that point. Let me go grab my eraser. We're gonna start off with our first test, measuring right where we started off at here. But instead of reading the 12.4 or so that I would normally expect to see, I may only measure 6.3. What's going to affect that measurement? The voltage available is going to be split among all the resistances in the circuit in proportion. So let's just say, for example, that the resistance of this light bulb and the resistance of the fuzzy little connection are the same, then they're going to take half each when it comes to the voltage needed to get that current to flow through them. Very important, I want to make sure you understand this. We said beginning, all the available voltage, all the available voltage is needed to overcome the resistance in the circuit to get current flowing. So that when it gets to the end, when it gets back to the ground side of that last source of resistance, there will be no more voltage potential left, okay? If there are more than one source of resistance, then the voltage available will be split proportionally to those resistances. So all of these are going to have a little bit of a drop across them. All of these are going to demand their little fair share. But if there's an issue along the lines, like a bad connection or badly corroded contacts, anything that's going to increase the resistance of that particular link in the chain, that's gonna demand even more of its fair share. With me? So by the time we get to the load and we make our first measurement, we'll see that we're not getting what we should at the load, and that's why the load can't work. If it's only getting half the voltage that it should be getting, well then the current flow is only gonna be half, isn't it? And that's why that bulb is gonna be very dim indeed. Now how do we find where the thief is? Well that's very easy. We're just going to start moving backwards, measuring along until we get to the point where our meter reading returns to what I would normally expect to see. So let's just say that now I place that meter lead here, and now I see my 12.4 again. Okay, let me make sure it doesn't look like a 13. So now I see my 12.4 again. As soon as I pass the point where the fault lay, my meter reading will return to normal. If I move my meter reading just off to one side of that, I come to this side now, then it's going to go back to that 6.3 that we saw earlier. And that is going to tell me that here's where the problem lies. All right, are you with me with that point? So that's how we find the voltage drop on the power side of the circuit. Now there is another way to use this technique. And I'm going to demonstrate that here in a moment. Let's see if I can clean this up so we can go back to our testing. All right, so now again, we're gonna place our, let's just say the bulb is not working the way we want it. It's still glowing dim. However, our measurement on the power side of the circuit is normal, it's fine, it's 12.4. So obviously the problem is not on this side of the circuit. Does that mean it can't be on this side of the circuit, the ground side? Of course not. In fact, 
the ground side of the circuit where it's going to be even more common to find these problems. Now I want to stress here that as just like the diagram shows, very rarely are the components on the vehicle wired directly back to the battery to complete that ground path. The body and chassis, the engine block, all of these are used as ground points and that way we only need a couple of uh, cable spots to uh, ground the body or ground the engine blocks to the battery to finish that path. So we've got all this path here that we have to make sure we check. So we're going to start off just like we did before. We're going to move our negative meter lead here and I'm going to move my positive meter lead to this side of the, of the load, the ground side of the load. If there's a source, a problem, corrosion in that connector, then it's downstream and it's doing the same thing that its cousin did earlier up here. It's screaming out, I want my share. So what's going to happen at the bulb? Well, the bulb's not going to get everything that we want it to. That voltage isn't going to start off at 12.6 and stay all the way through. It's going to only take what it's allowed, its share. So we're going to measure the 6.3 on the ground side of the battery. That's going to give us that voltage reading, even though my meter leads are both at a ground point. Now, you with me here? The voltage doesn't start off, it goes, um, it, I can explain this. I want to make sure I get this clear for you guys. No matter where that thief is, no matter where that thief is in the mix, it's going to demand its fair share. Now in this case, it was in front of the load, so to speak. So we can see the 12.4 going in and then the 6.3 left coming out for the battery. I mean, excuse me, for the bulb. So that kind of made sense, didn't it? That's easy enough to follow. But now we're on the ground side. Now the load is coming first and there's a source waiting on the other side. So we're still going to measure that 12.4 going in. That's going to tell us everything up to that point is okay. And then when I move my lead over to the ground side of that connector, the ground side of that load, now I'm going to be measuring how much voltage that second source, that second uh, source of resistance is waiting on. Does that make more sense? Earlier, when we were looking at it on the truck, we had a 1.7, I believe it was, volts showing on our meter. That means that somewhere between the alternator body, the case ground, and the battery negative terminal, there is something there, some source of extra resistance, whether it's a loose connection, a corroded connection, or a damaged harness, or a corroded cable, whatever the case might be, that's saying, hey, I'm going to let you have the 10 point whatever, but I want 1.7 for me. So that's what our meter was telling us. It's telling us that you do not have a clean path to ground. There's another source of resistance that's reducing the overall current flow. That's making that bulb glow dimly. And now I need to find it. How do I find it? Again, we do the same way we did on the positive side. We just keep moving our lead back towards the battery until our meter reading returns to normal. What would be normal in this case? Just a few tenths of a volt. Why is that, Pete, when earlier you said normal would be going back to 12.6? Well, that's a valid point, so I want you to try to understand and hang in here with me. Remember what I said. All of the available voltage is going to be consumed by the resistances in the load. So when I get past that last major source of resistance and I only have a few tenths left, all the available voltage has been consumed. Well, not quite. There's still a little bit. Why is there a little bit? Because I still have to get through the ground connection here at the body. I have to follow that body all the way back up to the front of the vehicle where the battery is located. I have to go through the contact at the negative cable there at the body and back through that cable to the battery. All of those are sources of resistance, remember? So there's a few tents that you're going to see there. Uh, there's a lot more in voltage drop testing on our, on our channel and in the magazine. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to look those up and study them. 
And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and talk to me. I'll be glad to do everything I can to help you out mastering this method. I'm a firm believer that this is probably the single best electrical testing method you can have in your arsenal. Once you've got it down, once you understand why you can read voltage when both your leads are attached to a ground point, you'll be solving a lot of electrical problems that the other guys in the shop just keep struggling with. So until next time, this is Pete Meyer. Thanks for watching.